As we consider the importance of making disciples, not just converts, I wanted to share with you a story of something that actually happened to me. I went to this particular nation where a year before they had had a gigantic evangelistic crusade with over a million people present. Hundreds of thousands of decisions for Christ were registered by that uh, evangelistic crusade. When I went to this uh, particular city that the crusade was in, I met with the pastors. We were doing a seminar. And I asked the pastors, I said, where, what happened? You, you must have had explosive growth in the church. And they all kind of looked down and seemed sort of embarrassed. And I was wondering, what, did I say something wrong? What, what happened? And what came out was the pastors told me that with all of these converts in this great event, it had not impacted their churches at all. The people did not come from the crusade into the local church. And I asked them, I said, what happened to these people? And the pastor said, well, they went back to their villages. They went back to their old way of life. They went back into the city and just continued to live the way they lived. And I thought, how terrible. Because the truth is that once a person has been won to Christ but not discipled and they fall back into their old way of living, Peter says it's like a dog going back to its vomit they are harder to win the second time. There is a real problem with reversion for those who have not been discipled. And when I say reversion, I'm talking about making some kind of commitment to Christ or uh, signaling that they want to become a Christian, but then they fall back into their prior religion or their prior way of life. They have reverted back. And one of the best ways that we can prevent people from falling back is by making sure they have been discipled, securing them in their commitment to Christ. This is a critical issue facing the church. The scriptures talk about in the end times there will be a great falling away. Do you know why? Because people have not been rooted and grounded in Christ. And when Jesus in Matthew and in Mark talks about the four kinds of soil, there's those who make a commitment to Christ, but when the sun comes out, when there is persecution or resistance or trial, they fall back into their old way because there is no root. Discipleship helps people grow a deep root in Christ and in His Word. So a critical part of our assignment as leaders, as Christ followers, is to make sure that everyone is discipled into Christ that that root goes deep into Christ. And this has a better chance of keeping them than if they just simply attend meetings. I have heard it said, and I believe it's true, that evangelism without discipleship is like fathering children without raising them. I think God is going to hold us accountable for what we do in ministry, not just in doing an altar call, but then what we do with these newborn babies after we have them. Well, when you study the book of Acts, particularly in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 to 47, we looked at that passage in an earlier teaching. It was the making and multiplying of disciples that made possible the continuing growth of the church and the expansion of the gospel of the kingdom in the surrounding cultures. And you can see that in the book of Acts not only by studying Acts 2, 40 to 47, but also, think of this. In Acts chapter 1, there were only 120 followers of Jesus. That's all. And they were waiting in an upper room, praying, seeking God, not knowing what to do, waiting for this promised Holy Spirit that they did not really understand. But then the Holy Spirit falls in great power. Peter stands up, preaches homiletically a poor sermon. His scripture reference was too long. He didn't have three points. He didn't open his sermon with a funny story. His points did not all begin with the same word or the same letter. But when he preached under the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 men came to Christ. Now, they only numbered the men, but I would bet there were even more women that came to Christ and their children as well. Praise God. Then in Acts 4.4, 4, you read about the fact that there are now 
over 5,000 men. And again, I imagine there were even more women and children too. By Acts 5.14, a short time really after Pentecost, by Acts 5.14, scriptures tell us that there were a multitude of men and women. Now this is amazing. When you look at the book of Acts and you see the growth of the church, you have to ask yourself some tough questions. Did they have Bible colleges? <laughs> no. Did, did the believers have a lot of money to start programs? No. Did they have wonderful, beautiful church buildings with plush seats? No. Did they have glass podiums where the pastor can stand up and speak eloquently? No. Did they even have a Bible, what we know today as the New Testament? No. Well, then what did they have in this phenomenal growth that started right at the beginning of the growth of the church? How did this happen? May I suggest to you that they had three very critical things. Number one, they had great prayer. These people prayed. They prayed and prayed and prayed. And God, we know, God hears and answers when we pray, especially when we're praying according to His will. And they were not praying to escape from suffering or persecution. No, they were praying, as you read the, the end of, the cha of chapter 4 of the book of Acts, they were praying that God would give them boldness to share even more the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of persecution. And what did they have besides prayer? They also had a fervent desire, a burning desire to tell others about Jesus, to see Jesus be born into the lives of other people. And finally, they had the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit. They depended upon the Holy Spirit. They looked to the Holy Spirit. They were obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They believed in the Holy Spirit to manifest the power of God, the power of the kingdom in their midst. Can I say to you, pastors and leaders, people who follow Jesus, what we need today is the same thing, the same burning desire to share with people the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same sense of faith in prayer to believe God for great things, to ask Him to do great things in our world, not just for our comfort, not just for our pleasure, not just for our convenience, but to truly reach people for Christ. And third, and this is a very critical thing, as I travel the world uh, with the privilege of leading this ministry, I get to travel and I get to be with pastors all over the world. There is a very critical issue in our world right now. It has nothing to do with your official statement of faith or your theology. It has to do with are you allowing the Holy Spirit to have a preeminent place in your midst. I'm not talking about a style of worship. I'm not talking about if you raise your hands or you shout or you talk about the Holy Spirit. Do you really let the Holy Spirit move? and lead and manifest Christ in your midst. Today, people are hungry. They are desperately hungry for something that is real. Jesus did not come to bring us another religion. The people of this world are choking to death on religion. They are dying without hope. They are living without hope. And hope will only come from one place, and that is from knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Pastors, are you letting the Holy Spirit really, truly move and work? The Holy Spirit is not an idea or a theology. He is a person. As a matter of fact, He's not just a person. He is God, the Holy Spirit. And when you are coming and saying, I want the Holy Spirit to move, he is not there to do what you want at your beck and call. He is God. Are you willing to let God manifest His presence in your midst? We need the Holy Spirit more now than ever before. Let the Holy Spirit move in your ministry. Let the Holy Spirit move in your personal life. Follow the Holy Spirit. Listen to His voice and follow and obey Him. 
you and I as pastors and leaders, we're not going to be asked by God, how big was your church? How much, how much were, how, how, how big were your offerings? How nice were your chairs? We are not going to be asked that. We're not going to give an account for a big church, but we are going to give an account to God for how big the people were spiritually in our churches. And I have heard it said, and I agree, people have said, I would rather have 10 people that want to turn the world right side up for Christ than 10,000 who just sit in the sanctuary like spectators and do nothing, say nothing, and never grow. I hope you understand what I am saying. Thank you.